Steve. This, this piece is a, a cautionary tale on how even the most advanced industrialized states uh, can't seem to formulate social and economic policy without engendering things like global financial crisis. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to ridicule uh, my government for a period of time here. I hope you enjoy it. I'm not an American citizen, even if I'm a British academic. And it's, uh, it starts essentially with an assertion that Rajan made that ignoring the role of the government and the government-sponsored enterprises for all the horrendous uh, uh, problems in the financial community uh, that engendered this crisis is like ignoring <coughs> the elephant in the room. Okay? Uh, the problem begins with, uh, in Rajan's view, and I, I think it's correct, a steep educational gap uh, that, that steepens among the American people, consequent income inequality with globalization. Uh, the working class take it first, and the middle class take it second. And uh, the jobs get shipped to Malaysia, blah, blah, blah. And the government deals with this uh, with a policy called let them eat credit. Extension of cheap credit to the, uh, the uh, lower and, uh, and middle classes. Uh, who believe that since they were born in the United States, they, they have birthright to a uh, two-bedroom ranked style house and two cars in the garage. Yeah? Well, that's not necessarily the case, but we loan them the money to maintain their lifestyle and pretend there's no problem. Along with this, it, it comes uh, an increase in policy of uh, affordable housing to extend this to uh, long underserved uh, communities and so forth. Things like, I'm going to go through a number of stories of a number of policy failures. And how they snowball, not one of these things by itself, you know, is, is an issue big enough to cause crisis. Some people say this is a, a, a conservative bogey, okay, argument. Uh, when we read through it, we find it snowballs and it's really not. It starts with something called the Community Reinvestment Act of 1977, where Congress had originally just asked lenders <coughs> to make quite sure that they're doing everything they can to extend lending to traditionally underserved communities, largely, uh, you know, they mean inner city, um, often uh, people of color. And at that time, they would threaten to uh, block mergers and acquisitions, for example, of the banks if, uh, if they didn't do so. Um, over time, uh, starting with Clinton administration, Bush administration jumps on it big time. Okay. Some of the authors I, I quote have political access to Brian. <coughs> it's certainly a bipartisan failure uh, as, as it grows. Uh, under HUD, uh, the Clinton administration uh, threatened substantial funds to fail, the banks to fail to comply uh, with uh, new HUD regulations that now require lenders to prove, quote, an even handed distribution of loans across LMI, low to moderate income, and non-LMI areas and borrowers. So now from the mid-90s, it's not adequate to show uh, process, okay? The quality of outcome uh, was demanded in lieu of by regulators, in lieu of uh, a quality of, of process. And lending underwriting standards you know, begin to deteriorate seriously at this time. The only way bank examiners can meet these requirements is to frankly lower their lending standards to uh, uh, loan uh, buyers they wouldn't have previously served. Yeah. Um, loan to value ratios uh, on U.S. mortgages were typically 80 percent. Okay, um, at, at uh, most, all of my life, you need 20 percent down. They wanted the, the bank wanted you to have skin in the game. So if you walk away from uh, your mortgage, you're walking away from at least 20% equity uh, in the home. Those began to de decline um, by uh, between 2001 and 2006. 
Conventional conforming mortgages, 20% down, 30 year fixed rate, always been the mainstay of the US mortgage market. It fell from 57.1% in 2001 to 22.1% in 2006. Subprime loans, defined as those made to borrowers with blemish credit, rose from 7.2% to 18.8% in this period. And all day, those who are you know, buy the let, okay, or just speculating, or flipping, or traditional underwriting standards fee, it rose from 2.5% to 13.9%. Um, right, Ed, enter the GSEs, the government-sponsored enterprises, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who have been, uh, they're privately owned, okay, but had an implicit U.S. government guarantee against failure, because they always played some role and guarantee uh, mortgages to, uh, you know, peak housing ownership in the United States. Well, they got into a little accounting scandal um, with Congress in 2003. Congress finally decided to sign them a dedicated regular, regulator, which they hadn't before, the Office of Federal Housing Enterprise Oversight, and, and said, oh, by the way, okay, uh, we need you to join us in, uh, and have an affordable housing mission okay, uh, added to your chart. Uh, GSE's bent over backwards to comply with Congress, and there were wonderful benefits to Congress, such as $14.6 million in, in campaign contributions to key congressional officials on the right committees on the 2000 and 2008, 2008 election cycles. The GSC set up partnership offices in the key districts of, of key lawmakers, and often staffed by their relatives Ooh, of members of Congress. Isn't this cozy? Keep it in the family. Yeah. And of course, trillions of dollars of, of mortgage loans right, to their constituents. Congress is pretty happy with this arrangement. They're telling the American people they're, they're you know, getting affordable housing out there to them. Um, well, this is what happened. It had taken until 1997 for Fannie Mae to begin buying 97% loan value mortgages. By 2001, they purchased them with no down payment. By 2007, <coughs> Congress required them to demonstrate 55% of their mortgage purchases were LMI. 55%. 38% of all purchases had to be from underserved areas usually in inner cities. <coughs> 25% on loans have been made to low income and very low income borrowers. Okay. Close quote. Accordingly, uh, their purchases of joint mortgages uh, rose precipitously. Rajan cites Edward Pinto, the former chief credit officer for the Federal Housing Administration, who estimates by June 2008, uh, the GSEs, the FHA, and other government programs were exposed to about $2.7 trillion in subprime and Alte loans, which is probably uh, approximately 59% of all loans to those categories. Um, Rajan says by modestly. It's very difficult to reach any other conclusion. And this was a market driven largely by government or government influence money. Um, underwriting standards the, uh, continue to drop. Uh, basically, uh, in response to the creation of huge market and junk mortgage loans, they got a huge lift from U.S. government housing policy. And uh, the vast majority of mortgage purchases by the GSEs had one or more subprime characteristic between 2005 and 2007. I have a table in the paper demonstrating that most of them had multiple. You know, negative amortization, interest only, FICO stores, scores less than 620, when 660 is considered subprime, when value ratio is greater than 90. So, um, conventional loans fell from 79% of all mortgages in 2003 to 51, 50% by the end of 2006. The others rose accordingly. And, um, enter, Structured finance now and the credit rating agencies. 
Um, structure finance. Well, um, I've been interviewing a lot of people who are in this market. They take a pool of a couple thousand, three thousand mortgages, okay? uh, synthesize it into a bond, then tranche out according to risk. Right? So there's a steady certain pool of income coming in against the mortgages and subordination <coughs> to, from exposure. So if you have a super senior tranche, the safest, you get the lowest payout. It pays 12 basis points above treasuries. Yeah. And nobody wanted it, okay, because it didn't pay anything. So the investment banks who created them parked that on their own balance sheet. And that later bought them down. The senior stuff is rated AAA. Sometimes the mezzanine and junior tranches are also rated AAA. Sometimes they're rated low. So you sell the, they take the hit first. Uh, yeah, for the fall rate. So you sell those off to the hedges, okay? Uh, we want risk. The mezzanine and, junior and senior tranches you sell off to uh, um, his, his uh, pension fund, uh, his insurance company, okay? and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. Well, they're all rated to AAA by, um, uh, more, you know, they, a lot of these tranches were rated, rated AAA uh, by the credit rating agencies I have. Uh, Good deal of, of discussion in the paper about how that happened. But uh, the GSEs themselves also bought up AAA tranches. And the banking system bought up AAA tranches, as we're going to discover later, because Basel II capital adequacy requirements gives you low risk weighting for AAA rated securities. So the bank banking system had a, a huge incentive to load up with um, tri AAA rated um, tranches of, of junk mortgages, basically, yeah. uh, uh, throughout the banking system. So Basel II um, risk weighting um, provided additional incentive. The GSEs, uh, at, at, at their, their worst period, um, you know, we're buying up, I have some figures here, I didn't circle it, unfortunately, uh, huge uh, uh, segments of those trenches uh, as well. So uh, I quote one of my authors, without their commitment to purchase the AAA trenches of these securitizations, it's not likely the mortgage pools could have been formed and marketed around the world. Okay. When, when the GSEs are 60% of the demand, 60% of the market, they can create uh, the market okay. that everybody else uh, jumps in on. I have some interview uh, data in the in paper uh, one interview with uh, Mr. Jerry Fons, Jump Chrome Fons, who's a former managing director of the ratings giant Moody's Investor Services. And, and Jerry lost his job when uh, <laughs> they, he wouldn't go along with, uh, with this. The, the, the guy who headed up the structured finance ratings took over as president and, and sacked about 20, 20 naysayers with that, including Jerry. But let me get the interview from him because he didn't leave with a, uh, a non-disclosure agreement, okay. and he's he's happy he's happy to talk about it. So I, I asked him, you know, was was this a mistake? He says, well, no. Um, the ratings agencies helped create these markets. It was their bread and butter, and you had highly opaque, complex securities and bankers with the ability to play ratings agencies off against each other. The fee structures were very high. Um, and so the regulators are now saying, if you help design the security, you can't rate it. Well, Mr. Fons clearly asserts Moody's personnel helped design the structured strap securities they then rated. And we're pressured in this process to help the firm in uh, being rated design a security, some of whose tranches at least they could write triple A, rate triple A. And we're subject to pressure from other creators of competition. So it really begs the question of why regulators are now telling the rating agencies they, they can't do this. Why didn't the Securities Exchange Commission recognize and prohibit the practice before the crisis? They must have understood the issue or pay structure of rating compensation surely subjected the rating agencies to moral hazard. Um, and uh, probably really should have been obvious to <coughs> Regulators. These ratings, importantly, have really become institutionalized. Okay, these are nationally 
recognized statistical rating organizations. So the SEC writes a whole bunch of regulation that's gone down to state level regulation that says, you know, your pension fund, your insurance company has to have X percent of its investments in securities rated AAA by these two institutions. Um, now, they've sometimes gotten it wrong. I mean, spectacularly misplaced ratings could be seen with Enron, the scandal, the WorldCom, uh, the sovereign debt of many Asian nations during the Asian financial crisis was clearly was, was misrated, as have been this RMBS, residential backed mortgage securities, uh, which are a special kind of CDO, collateralized debt obligation. But more often they've gotten it at least roughly right. Okay. Um, the oligopoly um, generates the risk that even if you're skeptical about the rating, other people assume the AAA is a social fact and, and you better you know, make the same assumption. So um, even though they're really too complex to be rated or, or valued without high uh, complex computer models. So I went and I can't use the gentleman's name. He helped invent structured finance when he was with J.P. Morgan London. And up now he's working for AIG, the insurance uh, guy in New York. He got a $56 billion bailout. Well, this gentleman uh, called the Bistro when he, he created them, broad index structured trust offering. And essentially, structured finance was created, they had in mind pools of corporate debt originally. So people who wanted different exposure to, to various levels of corporate debt, they take 100 well known companies, right, and take various maturities of that corporate debt and structure that into a bond. But it was transparent. It, you know, there are 10K filings with the Securities Exchange Commission. You can go look at their balance sheet, see what's on it, and roughly make your own assessment of what kind of debt you're taking on. It's, it's, it's taking a pools of thousands of mortgages you know, and doing this um, was a serious mistake. Okay, it's just not, not transparent. The ratings agencies probably didn't understand how the mortgage underwriting standards would fall okay, as they were removed from it. Anyway, um, I, I asked a young woman in, in London who used to work for Merrill as a, uh, as a risk analyst you know, about her job. And do, do read the, the dialogue, because I, I think you'll find it fascinating. Basically, she, she says, well, no. I said, what, what do you do now? You know, uh, she said, she, she's telling me, I said, where's the default risk analysis? Well, no, we didn't, we didn't do any of that. Okay? They're, 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 they're buying these pools of mortgages. They're creating these structured bonds. They're parking the, the super senior stuff on their balance sheet. They did zero default analysis. They just bought the rating wholesale, right? Well, S&P kept telling us we're S&P, and it's triple A, triple A, triple A, right? But what did you do? Darling, yeah? <laughs> so here, you're a risk analyst from Merrill, and sweetheart, and you're telling me you didn't do any default analysis. What was your job? Yeah? Well, she did uh, liquidity analysis, risk analysis. And what's the risk that I can't sell this in the secondary market? Okay. Right. Like enough stupid other people to do this. There's, there's plenty of blame to go around. Actually, she had, a, she had a doctorate in physics, uh, 4.0 from Duke, and, and was, yeah, uh, very, very bright, using her statistical skills for this, and, uh, yeah? So she says, well, it's, it's something on my job that made me very frustrated, okay? Uh, she's Asian, so she has a, a certain way of speaking. Um, so I said, well, a standard poor's officer in New York told me and when I interviewed him in like September 2009 that um, they didn't cooperate with firms that structured these, pro these products. Uh, her response, laughter. I said, you're laughing? She says, well, that's very interesting. I had a job interview with S&P and they actually told me they publish and share it with everyone. What did they tell you? Did they tell you they cooperate with the investment bank? Not per se, but they're very transparent, let's put it that way. It's apparent enough that the investment bank can use their methodology to backward engineer a AAA rating for the super senior crunch. Not only the super senior. Also the senior, mezzanine, and the junior crunches. Yes. So the rating firms are sharing the methodology, okay, with bright, bright young ladies like this one, right? And they're backward engineering the product 
make sure everything gets put to right. right. So there's no, <laughs> no transparency into, oh, this is a lot of fun. Um, so Drew, uh, giant Drew at Standard & Poor's is the only person living and working today in a rating agency who would actually talk to me. But he's kind of a talking dog for them, you know, they put him on TV. And he had a minder in the room with him, okay? Yeah. I sat there and took copious notes, and I said, I, would you like a, me to burn an MP3 file of this digital recording? Oh, yeah, I'll take that. Okay. Um, so, no, they swore up and down that they, they didn't do anything of the sort. Um, look, it, I'm not qualified to make judgments about who uh, <coughs> was the problem. Um, it's possible that any malfeasance in the use of models by others is entirely the responsibility of those who employ them backward engineer the security structure on the radios. Um, the radios methodology certainly contained faulty assumptions about the quality of the underwriting standards, uh, but it's not clear that radios should know more about the quality of the mortgage pools and the investment banks that, that buy them. Uh, for our purposes, it's also unclear why potential misuse for investments, investment banks in structuring these on the publication of ratings methodology should have been considered and a concern to the rating agencies regulators. The methodologies are normally held very close as proprietary okay, by rating agencies. So I would see a red flag go up okay, when, when, when they're giving away uh, the rating methodology. But everyone at the SEC, SEC was bloody asleep. And they just the, 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 they knew the products were too complex. They just relied on the raters to rate them correctly. And the raters did not do so. Basil kept the lab frequency rules. I told you, you know, AAA means Essentially, um, you've got a 20% risk weight times the 8% capital average the requirement. So only, uh, you only have to set aside 1.6% on your balance sheet of capital and reserves against the value of AAA securities versus 100% for a commercial model, uh, for example. It's clear what happened there. I'm pointing out in the paper that this problem of Basel II um, saying AAA and sovereign debt carries no, no <laughs> sovereign debt carries no risk weight. It's more fun. And so if you read this paper, go to page 21, I pulled out the uh, exposure of uh, German, uh, uh, European commercial banks to uh, a distressed sovereign debt issues in Europe, particularly Greece, Ireland, Portugal, uh, United Spain, and Italy. And uh, there's 179 billion, 0.5 billion, that was over a year ago. I'm sure it's worse now. Uh, Euros owed by Greece, Ireland, and Portugal to European banks alone. German and French banks are exposed to 34 billion, uh, over 41% of the total debt, and British. Uh, Germany's exposure is 43.6 billion, 24%. Okay. So, you know, these, these decisions about bailouts, okay, from uh, Angela Merkel and others are, are not uh, mysterious. Okay? You know, we, we bail or the European banking system goes down. Okay? I don't think you've seen the banking crisis in Europe. Okay? Uh, Greece is, is, is dissolving into bloody chaos. Ireland wants to burn the bondholders. The Portuguese aren't going to be patient very long. And, and, and everybody on the street says haircuts are coming from all three of those. Okay? And haircut is normally 50%. A minimum okay. uh, default rate. If we add Italy and Spain, we have uh, 70, 763 billion euro exposure of European banks for those five sovereigns. So those go down, and you've got basically a trillion dollar, a trillion euro hole in the, uh, in, the in the pocket. That's just off, right straight off the balance sheet of German commercial banks, ignoring what the ECB bought them. Okay. Right. So, are we having a good time? Yeah? We having fun yet? Finally, <laughs> great. This why I drink. Rocky. Finally, um, Lane. Um, right. Everybody, I've conducted about 40 interviews with the Einstein's who trash the global financial system in New York and London. And, uh, yeah, exotic field duty in, in Manhattan and Mayfair. Rough, rough stuff. I'm giving up my body for science and, and uh, the bar of the Waldorf and, and places like that. I try not to burden my friends with it. Uh, 
and uh, none of them have told me uh, anything, but the, the real game changer for them was when the government let Lehman go down. They, they had saved Bayer, okay? Uh, they'd saved long-term capital management with, with private deal in 98 because of that systemic exposure. And they let Lehman go down, and they didn't understand the county party risk at all. So you're, you're talking to these people, and they go, my God, you know? Everybody stopped trading on everything. Okay? They, the LIBOR rate went through the roof. It went over 400 basis points. When you're paying 400 basis points, 4% of the bank rate for an overnight loan, no one's buying. Okay? Credit is essentially frozen. Everyone's hoarding cash. They don't know what's on their balance sheet. They don't know what's, yeah, they don't know what's on the counterparty's balance sheet. And, and they just stopped trading. So I have uh, a guy who's trading a CLO. CLO CMO, it's a, a CDO with an agency wrapper. And he couldn't sell that stuff. He couldn't get a bid on that stuff. After the government went into conservatives, took the GSEs into conservatorship, full guarantee, no default risk, couldn't get a bid right? on the stuff. So there's an extended discussion about um, uh, that, that expect, failure of expectation. So I'm going to conclude. I need you one uh, or two minutes, OK? Um, if you conclusions. So, um, had time permitted, I would also elaborate it on the very far too loose or asymmetric monetary policy of the United States over a 15-year period. There's another critical error that generated what I call intersubjective expectations, shared social understandings of economic cause and effect between actors in the financial community. And uh, they contributed to the crisis. This generated the Expectation of an endless wall of liquidity. I have tons of interview data about this. Uh, the result of too much money chasing too few real assets. And if this project moves forward uh, to a conference volume, and people fill the spits, so I'll correct that okay. uh, at that time. In each of the policy areas I did explore, this problem and generating a housing bubble and a related crisis, government policy changed into subjective expectations of key actors encouraging them to behave in ways they would not otherwise have behaved. Federal housing policy under the Community Reinvestment Act and congressional pressure on the GSEs altered the housing industry's previously shared expectations of both permissible and judicious mortgage underwriting standards. They altered the GSEs' previously shared expectations for their function in facilitating mortgage lending through purchasing mortgages with implicit government back backing against the law. The Basel Capital Adequacy Standards altered previously shared understandings of bank managers of what constituted a safe asset on the balance sheet. The failure of Moody's and, and the rating agencies of structured uh, securities ratings propagated a social fact of the AAA rating, clearly acceptable to all on a clearly very poor quality financial product. The failure of regulators to assess this tragedy permitted the balance sheets of the banks, the GSEs, Insurance firms, pension funds worldwide to be severely damaged by these assets and their default rates. Zero risk rating, rate, rate weighting for sovereign debt and the Basel capital adequacy requirements have permitted worldwide banks, but particularly European banks, to load up their balance sheets with sovereign issues from Greece, Ireland, and Portugal, to which the markets clearly believe they're going to take the large haircuts. The decision to let Lehman fail demolishes previous shared expectations in the financial industry, that the government would not permit the failure of a large financial concern, which a major investment bank certainly is, <coughs> with hundreds of vulnerable counterparties. So finally, government policy uh, generates social and financial realities. Uh, when it fails, uh, the social consequences can be horrific. So, we're, we're state building, I guess, but be careful what you wish for. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And I would have. Uh